Hi, this is Gavin with Haverstick Designs, and this is The Sound Project. Today we get to catch up with Chip Freeman, owner of Susu Studio up in northern Michigan. Uh, we actually have a YouTube video that's a full walkthrough of his space, uh, but I wanted to catch up with him now that the studio's been open for a while and kind of see what he's been up to and how the studio's working out for him. So I hope you enjoy it. Hey, Chip. How you hey, doing? Hey, Gavin. How you doing? I'm good. I'm good. Um, I just saw you not too long ago. Um, that's right. We, my, my family, we, we went up and, and vacationed up there near your house. Uh, well, you know where we, we stayed at your cabin. Yeah. So somewhere in nice. Michigan, right? Yeah. Yeah. And uh, so um, so it's not really even like catching up. It's more like uh, good to see you again. <laughs> good to see you again. Um, thanks for joining us on the sound project. We, uh, um, uh, you know, I love, I love doing these kind of catch ups with, with, uh, uh, clients and kind of seeing how things are going. Um, obviously we've got the YouTube video feature on your studio, uh, which is, is beautiful. Um, and, uh, mm-hmm. but I wanted today to kind of catch up with now that you've been in the studio for a little while, talk a little bit about your background and things like that. And, and just give our audience a little bit more, uh, uh, in depth about chip, right? Because everyone needs to know more about Chip. Well, everybody needs to know more about Chip. Uh, well, you know, I was born in 1951, back in the day. I think my, my real name's Douglas, by the way, and I'm pretty certain that um, back in that day, Douglas MacArthur was a big deal. So I, I think oh, I'm named for General Douglas MacArthur. Uh, but anyway, I changed my name to ship in college when I could get away and actually control my own destiny as far as the name. Um, but you'd asked, you know, when did my music career start? And I guess it begins with my mother who was insistent that I take piano lessons at age six. She was a piano teacher and hated it. Just absolutely hated it. Um, flash forward to, uh, February of 1964, maybe it was December, I forget, the Beatles on Ed Sullivan. It's funny, I, right. I've seen a lot of uh, podcast videos of, of uh, musicians, professional musicians, successful musicians my age, and they're always asked, you know, what was it? What made it happen for you? And it was, it's always the Beatles on Ed Sullivan from my genre i'm talking about tom petty or steve lukather people like that it's like yeah boom and and to some extent just about anybody that's my age and uh that was kind of where it my, really I began know. although my mom um she she loved the beatles and uh she actually saw them live twice did you ever see them live i have never seen them live i've seen two beatles live individually yeah. Ringo's all-star band and then mm-hmm. uh, I saw Paul McCartney once so that's awesome yeah. yeah she she saw them at the Indiana State Fairgrounds and then she also saw them in Chicago and it's, it's always wild when I hear stories like this about my, my mom is just, just the sweetest person and and uh um you know when she was young she got her dad to drive her and her friends to Chicago <laughs> and and that night her and her friends, I believe, stole his car and drove around trying to find the hotel that the Beatles were staying at. <laughs> so, of course, it is just so—it's so wild to hear that about my mom because you would never expect that she would do something like that. No. The Beatles make everyone crazy. So that's that puts me in your mom's generation. That's you know. Yeah, I didn't want to and say that, Chip. But that, that's okay. That's all right. Um, my my father was still the guy that wanted me to have a crew cut, and when I came home, that was too long like too much up here in front he'd send me back mm-hmm. to the barber and uh, <laughs> anyway incidentally you awesome. hear crunching in the background charlie the studio dog chewing on the bone he can he's kind of right down there Man. so yeah, we're going to talk about charlie because Char- charlie's a big part of this studio so uh, uh, and also a part of- also a big part of why um you know probably in a year or so our family's going to get a golden retriever like between oh wow between Charlie and uh, Josh Dunn's dog Jim, um, mm-hmm. you know, at the same time, your project and his project was going on at the same time, and uh, I just fell in love with Golden Retrievers. So we're we're probably gonna make that oh, happen here soon. Beat him. A lot of hair, but you can't beat them. Yeah, yeah that's they're awesome. great. Sweet. So you saw the Beatles. Anyway, you saw the Beatles, so- and 
uh, that was kind of the precipice of, yeah. of all of this. Yeah. And it was just sort of the culmination of, of a few months of anxiety. I think my birthday was in November of, of in 63. Um, I got a little Zenith transistor radio. It was about that size. And I could fit it under my pillow and listen to the local AM station, actually, in Cincinnati. Um, you could get it from where I lived in Dayton. And, uh, they would play Beatles all the time. Um, so that was... I was fomenting my explosion, sort of, if that's good language. Um, but anyway, so after that, it was all about the Beatles. Yeah. And um, I used to, my brother brought home a, a, a guitar from Vietnam. And I used to strut around my room pretending I was George Harrison. So it was George Harrison that was my favorite Beatle. Yeah. For my mom, it was Ringo, uh, which... Um when I ended Ringo? up, okay. yeah, when I ended up getting, um, uh, I, I worked on Ringo Studio. Um, we didn't design it from the ground up, but he uh, he had all these issues at around sixty hertz, which is not something that you do to a drummer. <laughs> and so we got called in to, uh, you know, fix those things. So that's right in the kick drum frequency range. And uh, when I got blueprints with uh-huh. Ringo's name on it, my mom flipped out. You know, because uh, that was her favorite. Oh, yeah. Yeah, so that's interesting. Yeah, so um, so you know, the guitar was your your first thing. Yeah, guitar was the first thing, and the Beatles were the first thing, and, and those were my first songs that I ever learned. You know, Twist and Shout, the easier ones. Um, got in bands as soon as I could figure out how that was all how that all happened. Um, I remember my dad finally uh, buying me a. Fender Deluxe Reverb when I was probably 15 or so. And uh, he said, you know, if you do your homework as much as you practice your guitar, you won't need me to buy you any amplifiers anymore. Uh, I got the point. Didn't didn't mean much. (laughs) Didn't help a lot. Uh, But anyway, um, you know, fast forward probably to college. Um, I mean, there's a lot of music. Everybody's in bands all the time. I had the good fortune of realizing probably at age 16 or so that I was never going to be the lead guitar player that um, I needed to be in order to get in a good band. So I flipped over to bass and uh, and have been primarily playing that as a performance instrument ever since, although I spent a lot of time on acoustic guitar and stuff. Um, anyway... Um, in college, I continued on in bass, and, and although I was a science major in college, um, my interest lied far more in music and ended up not being a very good science major, but I really did well in, in bass guitar. And, and also, along the way, I had become a huge Yes fan. So Chris Squire um, was a major influence on me and my playing, and I had a Rickenbacker, the whole deal, you know, and... Uh, would play that in bands that really had no interest in Rickenbacker sound at all. You know, they wanted me to be James Jamerson, and I wanted to be Chris Squire, and it was a real um, conflict. But anyway, um, I played in a, what I considered to be a really good band in, in college, but they all, as bands do, you know, broke apart. And uh, at the end of my college career, a fellow that I played guitar with. Um, decided that it was time for us to go to California to seek our fortune. And um, at the time, I, I knew my wife. I'd met her in college. And um, my big plan was to go out to California, um, become famous, and call her on out. We'd get married and live happily ever after. <laughs> and, uh, <clears throat> so this is in 1975. And I remember driving out to California with my friend in a, in a van and uh, pulling a trailer and got out to California. I don't know why we landed in San Francisco, but that was where we headed because we had friends there. And by the time we got out there, you know, the good times had passed. I mean, you read some about, you know, the, the mid 70s on the West Coast was kind of like, you just missed it, kid, and everybody's now in rehab. 
and stuff like that. So it was a pretty big disappointment. We lasted about two or three or four weeks out there. Um, at the time, people like Neil Young and Jerry Garcia were playing in the coffee houses around town. It's like, where do we fit, you know? Yeah. <laughs> um, so got back in the truck, uh, and this is part of sort of the, the grand story. Um, feel free to edit this out. But <laughs> So my friend and I, who drove the, the white big Chevy panel van out there, piled everything back in the van. We found a rider, a woman who was a, a country singer. <laughs> ran into her in Oakland, California, and she was looking to get back to Columbus, Ohio, which is where we were headed. So all together, we jumped in the van, headed back to California, decided let's take the southern route because it was um, snowy in the mountains. Let's just say, I think it was probably March or something like that. Yeah. Um, and so we took uh, Route 66 back when it was actually Route 66. I mean, you got out of Los Angeles, I think, on 10 or something like that, maybe 40, I don't know. Um, but eventually we landed going you know, down through Nevada and all that and on Route 66, and that uh, was where the van broke. Uh, oh, wow. We had been drifting it along because it had a leaky radiator, um, which became my CB handle, by the way. That, that dates that, but anyway. Uh, we broke down about... Uh, a mile west of Winslow, Arizona. And we're fortunate enough that the guy who owned a gas station on the west end of town came out and towed us in and we became fast friends and he proceeded to take the next six weeks rebuilding the, the, the engine in the van. Uh, there were several um, misses and uh, <laughs> false, false, false drives getting out of town, but um, so we ended up playing in town to make money, and uh, we had a country singer, we had the guitar player, we had me playing bass, and we picked up a Native American drummer, and uh, we were the biggest thing in town. In fact, we got booked um, at what was once a Holiday Inn probably, and was something else, but uh, and and on the sign out front it said "Direct from San Francisco," and we <laughs> drew the crowd. That was our name, "Direct from San Francisco." Oh, that's awesome. Uh, they, so we had so fun. I, yeah. I didn't even know that part of it because all you had told me was that you went to California, it didn't quite work out, and so you ended up coming home. I didn't know of this, you know. Yeah, that that was the detour. that was the interesting part of the story. Yeah, I mean, for yeah. me, that was we. As much as my poor wife, future wife, sat home wondering where in the hell I was. Pardon the French. <laughs> um, I was in Winslow, you know, there was no cell phone. There were no cell phones out there. So occasionally I could get access to a telephone and call her. But um, so when I say I was standing on a corner in Winslow, Arizona, and we <laughs> sang that song every night. You know, of course, at, you have to. Of course, you had to. Contractually ob obligated to yeah. do that. <laughs> and uh, I did. And um, eventually... We got a vehicle. It wasn't the van. The van died finally completely, <laughs> and uh, we were we were traded a, an old Mercury sedan that we all piled in and drove back to Columbus, Ohio, and it made it. So that was the end of that adventure. And wow! Um, shortly thereafter, uh, I got a real job, and uh, that was kind of the the temporary end of my music career. Um, yeah. How how long between when you got back to Columbus and when you started picking up music more more fully? Um, how much? Well, I how never much I never really gave it up fully. I mean, it was always a big part of my brain, you know. And uh, Susan, um, my wife, was also a music enthusiast, and she put up with it and but enjoyed it and. Um, and I still had a lot of had a lot of friends who played, and I actually um, my first studio. I don't know if I ever told you this was in a house on Maple Street in Granville, Ohio, in the living room. This is like kids, right? Hey, I know mm -hmm. what we're going to do. We're going to take the living room and we're going to make it a recording studio, okay, honey? Oh, yeah. sure. <laughs> and this is before kids, of course. And um, so I bought a Tascam eight-track tape recorder. The f I think it was the eight channel board and a few microphones. I still have the old RE20 that I bought in 1975 and that's got to be vintage by now. Or 1975. Did I say 25? I meant 75. But anyway. <laughs> um, 
Um, so that that was the first studio, and I spent a fair amount of time doing commercials for a, a brand of product called Rax Roast Beef, which competed oh, with Arby's. Oh no way! I, I don't remember. know if there are. There was a Rax in Muncie, Indiana, where I grew up. So really, um, we used to go Still? there. Actually, <laughs> I have a really funny story uh, about Rax. Is that um, uh, where were we? We were on vacation somewhere, and. Uh, my mom went into a restaurant and asked them if they had racks in town, you know, like, and the person behind the counter said, occasionally there's one in the back room, but like, not all the time. Like he thought he, we said rats. Um, and then he had just admitted <laughs> that they had rats in their kitchen. Um, so, uh, but yeah, that's funny. So you, <laughs> yeah. So you did commercials for them? Well, I had a, one of our closest friends, um, he was the marketing director for a, a, a bunch of Rax franchises. And he's, you know, he got into the whole idea of, hey, let's do some commercials. And his kids were in the commercials. And I mean, it was, I didn't write them, I just recorded them. And all of us sort of did the vocal parts. It was, you know, audio, of course, just yeah. radio spots. But that's um, awesome. I'm sure I did a terrible job and I don't have any <laughs> of it left over. So. Yeah, I was going to, uh, it'd be hilarious if I said, and I've got that clip right now. I've and got to play that. it for everybody. <laughs> you know, I'm sure it's buried in some box someplace, but uh, right. all I can remember was the final line was one of his kids saying, let's go to Rex, Dad. <laughs> and uh, like, just to laugh about that a little bit. Uh, that is awesome. I love so it when people that, put their kids in commercials. I think maybe Grayson and Sylvia need to make a make an appearance in a Haversick Designs jingle. Oh, yeah. Maybe you yeah. could help help write you now just in your new studio. Do that next time you're up here. We'll make a commercial. <laughs> we could great. make it for one of the local restaurants up here. They would gladly have one. But, uh, yeah, that'd be awesome. Uh, so you had that first studio, uh, Maple Street, right? And then... Um, yeah, Maple Street, Granville. And, and then you... Uh, did you next move to the house that you, you had in Columbus area? Um no, we um, eventually grew out. We have four kids and eventually grew out of that one and, and built another house in the same area, uh, Granville. And um, that did not have a studio. But the next time, which was several years after that, um, I did build a studio and actually had spent a lot of time practicing to be a, um, a studio architect, Gavin. So you're lucky I didn't succeed. Oh, man. Uh, I, I, I bought some business. books on studio stuff. and uh, You may have heard of this guy named Michael Rettinger, who wrote a lot of audio books, or, or actually they were scientific acoustic type books, which was a little thick, but they did have nice diagrams. Mm -hmm. So I actually created, um, when we built the house, I put in a, a, a lower level that was big enough. And the only thing I was really sure about was it couldn't have parallel walls. So I have the only studio that's kind of a whacked out hexagon basement <laughs> in uh, Grand Villa High. Um, awesome. So yeah, and it's, it's still the one I use when I'm home. Um, it doesn't have anything, you know, it's nothing like this one. Um, but, you know, uh, it's it does the job if it's just little demo stuff and uh, good learning spot I must say so you know a lot yeah. of my early early work uh, was done in that place with people coming in and I put some eight or nine piece bands in a in a room about the size of the one I'm sitting in right now and that was tight uh, yeah <laughs> loud and loud and your and your son's a drummer right yep um, my youngest son is carrying on the tradition of rock and roll, and he actually is, a, I would call him a, um, a hired gun. Uh, he, his base is Columbus, Ohio, and he's, he's played in a lot of bands. His current band is a reggae band that is traveling around the East Coast right now as we speak. Mm -hmm. um, kind of, I would call them progressive reggae. They're not quite the Bob Marley kind of thing, but it's a, a little bit upbeat and um, cool. a lot upbeat, actually, so. Uh, and they're having a, a good time, and it's um, he likes it a lot because they're really professionally set up and know what they're doing as far as touring and all that. And 
Yeah. Now, and he doesn't have to worry about it. If they don't have a crowd, he gets paid. <laughs> they have a crowd, he gets paid. It's always yeah. the same number, but you know, at least he's not working for free any particular night. And they've had a few of those every now and then. Sure. Yeah. Um, I'll plug them. The name of the band is the Quasi Kings. Yeah. Out of Columbus, Ohio, and they're. Uh, Remember you showed me that when I was up there last yeah. time. So. Um, so, you know, after the uh, Carmarthen, pro- that was in Granville, Ohio, and. Um, and we found our way up here to uh, this spot in Michigan. Um, originally found an old cottage on Lake Michigan um, that was pretty much a wreck. This is in 1997. And over the course of the last you know, so many years, it's been improved and renovated and made big enough for four kids and their families. And, and that kind of brings us to this place. And that yeah. is uh, that when you put four children and their children in a relatively small place and they want to start having fun about 10 o'clock and mom and dad <laughs> want to go to bed, it's time to start thinking, man, it would be nice to have some place to go to. Mm-hmm. And that became this place. And um, we found the property and started the project. Um, and it was always going to have this room. I mean, I was in touch with you very early in the process, and that yep. was primarily through, I think, um, Jacob. Well, actually, it was Jason Carson, who has been my acoustical or my electronic um, equipment consultant, connecting me to Vintage King, um, and Jacob um, Schneider connecting me to you, and yep. the rest, as they say, is history. <laughs> and it was, you know, I feel very fortunate to have stumbled across uh gavin haverstick gavin haverstick um because <laughs> this is an amazing place and uh, yeah, i love it well I, I remember when when jacob first reached out um and he told me that that um you know about the project a little bit and i i just instantly got excited about it because for one you know the location of it you know being right on the on the water up there and mm-hmm. and uh just kind of being like a a destination spot um i always and, yeah. and the fact that it, it was like kind of standalone uh it's attached to the garage but the garage is just uh off of the house a little bit and so obviously we needed to isolate it and things like that to not disturb neighbors but um yeah. you know it's a kind of ideal situation to have a kind of retreat you know just to, to go into mm-hmm. the studio well and, and i've said this um originally I just wanted a place to mix because that's really what I like to do. And um, I guess you got to record first before you can mix. So there's that. But um, I never really had a room where I could mix that was a really well done room and um, sounded sounded good. Um, and so that's about the time we connected with you and you did this beautiful design and then then my wife passed away suddenly a couple a uh, year and a half ago roughly and the scope of the project changed because suddenly I, I had a lot of time on my hands and I decided well I she and I had been thinking about this making it a destination kind of location where you have people that want to get away write music record the demo do whatever um, and I decided well you know what I'm gonna pull pursue that full theme because uh, yeah. I've got the time and uh, I contacted Jason again and instead of just you know what what do I need to just make a nice mix room and at that point in time we were talking about um, you know computer and a small workstation kind of a thing and and then I said well so what if I want to try to attract professional talent and have them come in here and do some recording. And he said, well, now the budget just went, got real big. And right. I said, well, okay. Um, and we ended up, you know, creating a, a pretty well equipped studio with API equipment or API console and a lot of outboard stuff. The ATC speakers that I'm staring at right now mm-hmm. uh, are amazing. And it, and you build a room around all that stuff, which is phenomenal. I mean, well, and uh, and that kind of pivot in the direction of the studio and everything like that happened while we were in the thick of doing the design, you know. And, and yeah, uh, um, the one thing I'm, I'm always glad that we did was um, 
make that control room as large as we did. Um, and we do that already just to make sure that it sounds good and, and the low frequencies translate well to other systems. But then it's also the place everyone mm -hmm. hangs out in anyway. Um, it, but I'm glad we made it as big as we did because we weren't planning for that big of a console to start <laughs> and uh, yeah. it, it fits perfectly in there. But um, you know, if it was much larger, it wouldn't. Wouldn't fit. There's a couple of feet on either side of it, you know, over here. Yeah. I'm, I'm looking at it. Um, and you probably fit another bay then, right? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you know, we're going to go from 32 to 48 you know, and yeah. push out that wall. Can we yeah. do that? Can you move that wall for me? Anything's uh, possible, Chip. You know that. No. Possible. <laughs> I'll take off the double sliding doors right over here and we'll just move right that direction. There we go. Well, I'm I'm, I'm going to share uh, my screen here because I I ended up uh, I put together some a uh, bit of a slideshow of some of the photos you sent me uh, over the time that we were working on this this uh, project, um, and it it really it all started with this uh, this amazing view that you have. I remember um, mm -hmm. you you sent this photo to us and said this is you know, looking out of the studio, this is what we're going to see. And, uh, that was just super inspiring for me because, um, you know, it, 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 so many ideas ran through my head about what the studio could be just from this photo, you know, just like what you'd yeah. be looking at every day. Um, and so, um, and that's exactly where the studio is. It's, it's, uh, the door to your, to your right, as you're sitting there right now, mm -hmm. looks out over this, this, uh, lake and, um, just beautiful and just peaceful and, um, I mean, I always, every project we take on, I get excited about, but like, there's something special about this. When I got this photo, I was like, wow, like this, this is a place that, um, that I would, I would like to have in my backyard. So, um, <laughs> so we, we started there, um, you know, we did a lot of design work and everything like that, but then, um, uh, you know, we had, uh, um, just when like the, the footers were poured and everything and, and just kind of really early on, uh, some of the mm -hmm. earth moving, moving going on there in the background, um, uh, you can see, uh, neighbors houses there, um, uh, in this shot. And so isolation was a concern, um, not only to them, but being on a lake sound carries across water super easily. Uh, and, and so, uh, wanted to make sure that you didn't disturb other people, but then also, if the neighbors cut their grass or they're chopping wood or doing something out there making noise, that it's not going to cause a problem for you. So, jet skis uh, on the lake, that's a major concern. Yeah. Yeah. So th that was part of the plan. And we'll kind of get into that. This is like a, a early, like, uh, you know, floor plan. This is actually the, the floor plan that we are, we arrived at. Um, we, had done a couple other things. We made some adjustments and, and all of that, but really what you wanted is, you know, that, that large control room, um, then an, an ISO booth, uh, that's over here, uh, for mm -hmm. large enough to do drums or pretty much any sort of instrumentation in that space. Um, as you come into the, the studio area, there's a little amp room, uh, there, uh, you know, yeah. it's only a, about four foot by three and a half or so. And then there's a bathroom and a workbench, you know, to be able to, to work on any equipment or guitars mm -hmm. or anything like that. So, um, you know, that was the, the idea as far as the layout goes, we always start with the layout first, get that approved. And then we start to go into details about how it needs to be constructed and, uh, you know, with the isolation that we needed, we wanted to do kind of a, a room within a room uh, for each of these spaces. Um, there's a couple areas where we couldn't quite pull that off, and so we ended up uh, using some clips and channel systems. But uh, overall, I mean, uh, I mean, you could speak to it, I guess. That when I was, I've been there multiple times now, but um, yeah, isolation's great. You know, you can yeah, yeah have have you see these double doors that are here. Uh, it's it's uh, we got a set of exterior doors and then another set of of doors on the inside side that are all sealed really well double windows and um you know uh, it, it, when when you shut those out it's like you're in a different world the next thing that we uh we look at here um is is uh, just more progression there on after the footers are, are done you know, kind of getting the space prepared to, to start with framing you see that that view out there to the lake um that opening that's that's here uh mm -hmm. that is uh where those double doors were going um, and so that's the control room on the far side of this this photo um yeah. and then you kept sending me photos like i always i love getting the um 
yes, the updates and, and uh, you know, it's exciting to see it, it come to life because we were designing for quite a while. I kind of skimmed over that a little bit, but like there was a lot of design work that happened before anything could get, get uh, fully framed up. Um, and here's the, the studio there on the left and uh, they're starting the, the, the framing uh, portion of things, um, putting up the, the ceiling trusses. And, and again, those ceiling trusses are to hold up the, the building, not to uh, uh, hold up the, the rooms, because the rooms had separate ceiling joists that we, we uh, applied to that. Um, and here's the backside, kind of looking at the, the, the garage, uh, some of the trusses that are there. Um, one of the big things that we had to plan ahead for was all the conduit runs. Um, and, and this is a, a big part of the process is that we've got to get, we're creating these airtight waterproof rooms mm -hmm. and then we got to get cables, uh, from, from one spot to the next in some way. And so since we were pouring a slab in there, we ended up running the cables in conduit underneath the slab. And so, uh, all these green and red and, and blue, uh, sections here are all conduit. So we have a trough in the front, uh, it's about two foot by three foot. And then it runs, uh, conduit from that trough to the back of the room, uh, here in the, uh, the pink area, which is another trough that splits off into each corner of the room. And you have like mic plates and inputs in the back. So if, you know, mm -hmm. someone wants to plug something in, in the back, they don't have to run a cable all the way uh, across the room and it makes everything really clean. No, no tripping hazards and stuff. Plus Charlie would probably just eat the cables yeah, and eat right through them. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so then we have coming off of that main trough. We are also running into the, uh, live room uh into the amp room uh, we even did a little uh, connector between the the amp room and the in the bathroom in case you wanted to you know record in the bathroom as well i don't i don't think you've done yet but uh maybe someday it's potentially useful as a little uh echo space but i don't right. know that there's gonna be a, anyway yeah, uh, and then we, we have a couple lines just coming off the trough to go to the front uh, um, area here because uh, we we're kind of uh, planning for potentially soffit-mounted speakers or um, mm -hmm. you know, maybe running up and over if you ever went to Dolby Atmos at some point. Yeah. Um, so, and then there's one line that goes out to the garage area, which then could be run up to, uh, there's a room ab above this area, which uh, is not finished yet, but we've had some conversations about doing something up there so mm -hmm. um so just trying to f future proof things you know and try to yeah. try to make it that it's uh you're not handcuffed into like one right. thing well i we did future proof it because it's wired in every which which way direction you know, so. <laughs> yeah and these are just some photos uh that you sent over as uh, they were laying out the conduit and so uh, you can see that the trough to here on the left picture uh, where the mixed position is and those uh um Conduit's starting to be run. Um, notice too that you don't just do 90 degree um, swoops up. It, it's kind of a more gradual um, and coming up at, a, at more of an angle. You see that in the center picture uh, really well as it comes out and over. And that is uh, to make it easier to pull the wires, you know, and make sure that, that uh, you don't have um, uh, trouble getting those, those wires through those conduits in a, in a gentle um swoop is better um, but yeah these, these troughs were put into place the one in the center right here is the the back wall that goes kind of behind the couch and um, it feeds to each corner so that that was kind of exciting times because I mean framing up the room I'm sure it was nice for you to be able to walk in there and say like, oh I, yeah. I see see what kind of space but this was the start of it is because before the slab was yeah. poured all this had to be run what were you thinking when went on do you think I was crazy or um, you know what uh, or maybe the contractors thought I was crazy. I was concerned. <laughs> no. Um, you know, it just, to me, it, it was a little hard to see how it was going to happen. And it's interesting that this project was built. Uh, all the construction work was done by the contractor that did the house that's attached to it, or I should mm -hmm. say it's attached to the house anyway. Yeah. Um, and so this is really the first anything like this he's ever done or his company um mm -hmm. they've never done a recording studio and that i was blessed with a foreman on this job who was a brilliant carpenter and a former musician and was thoroughly into this project um he poured his heart and soul into getting everything exactly right as drawn um and that includes digging the sand you know i mean it just all the way and he stuck with it until the very end and um 
his name's Brian and he's just a great guy and he's, he loves this place and, and the whole crew. I mean, it's, it was such a cool project for them, you know, cause the conduits and, the, and, the, and, and all the walls and all this kind of stuff. I mean, they looked at the plan set and just thought, what? And, uh, <laughs> and they just started working through it and, um, did a beautiful job. If anything, they overbuilt it. Sure. Um, you know, I, I remember we, we hired a company from, uh, Detroit to do the, the wall treatments. Mm -hmm. That was not something they had expertise in. Um, my contractor, Biggs construction. Um, so we got set up with the company from, uh, Detroit. I forget their name. You probably Solar have. two studios, I think. Solar two studios. Yeah. yeah. Um, and they, they just came up, you know, we planned it out. They came up, they followed your design for the most part. Mm -hmm. uh, not, you know, entirely followed your design. Yeah. And um, did a beautiful job, built most of the stuff in Detroit, pulled it up, got it up here in a trailer, and installed it in about three days. Yeah. And it was, that was spectacular to watch. And even some of the big guys would stand around and go, whoa. Yeah. You know, as this whole thing was holding. So, and that awesome. happened pretty quick. You know, you get from one point and you're looking at drywalls and stuff like that. And all of a sudden, there's a room here, you know, mm -hmm. and all this gorgeous and, and, uh, and yeah. you know. I mean, they did an awesome job with that. And I've got some photos coming up here of kind of uh, what the room turned out before. Like, I, we can kind of keep moving here with the... Uh, this is a photo you sent after yep. they poured the concrete. And that's like a big step because... Uh, you know, all those spots that you see conduit popping up, like it's got to be right, you know, because uh, you want to make sure mm -hmm. that it's, it's popping up on the right side of the wall uh, that, that you want it to be <laughs> at. So so they, they did a great yeah. job being able to, to follow our plans and, and uh, having that all pop up. I, I know you were excited uh, at that stage. You sent me this photo <laughs> of you uh, um, with the thumbs up and the Vintage yep. King Audio uh, shirt. Thanks, Jacob. I had to talk him out of that shirt, by the way. That was something that showed up. <laughs> That's awesome. Uh, so, yeah, that was like a big deal. It was, you know, the concrete's in. Now it's time to, to frame it out. Uh, but actually, before that happened, yeah. we uh, cut the concrete slab for each room. So each room then um, we mm -hmm. took a... I say I always say we like I actually did any cutting, but um, Biggs, uh, you know, uh, construction they they cut the room so that they're isolated from each other, uh, and then we did a room within a room so there's framing on either side of those those mm -hmm. cuts so you can kind of see the base plates are being laid out here and you start to really mm -hmm. get a, a sense of the size and the shape of these rooms. Um, and you have one base plate on one side of the the cut and one's on the other side and they're really just their own floated rooms. Um, got yeah. some, uh, some more framing here. You see like a, a new ceiling that is being put on, uh, on those walls. And, uh, uh that's the, uh, uh, he's standing there in the entryway, um, and where the workbench is going to be, there's the bathroom and the, and the amp amp closet as well. Um, here's a wide shot in the control room looking at, uh, where the ISO room is there on the right. And one thing to note is like the, the, big sloped ceiling of that that uh, iso booth which is is great to get some extra volume you know being able to throw room mics up and get some some bigger sounds in that space because you know like you said your son's a drummer and and he's going to be using this room as well and just to be able to get a nice big drum sound out of the space that was one of our one of our mm -hmm. goals um Let's see. The next thing here is there's some resilient clips and channels. Those are the Kinetics Isomax clips, uh, inferring channels there on the front wall and on the ceiling, um, because we wanted to mm -hmm. maximize the vault of the of the uh, um, control room, and uh, so we we uh, yeah. you know just tied into the existing structure at that point. Um, you got some insulation in the exterior walls that are going in. Like it's all a process. And how how often were you? at the site while this was going on because uh, i know you lived in columbus most of the time yeah i think i probably came up every couple of months mm -hmm. um there was a stretch where i was here f for several weeks um uh, and la last summer or the summer of 21 i guess um which is when a lot of this was taking place yeah. uh, and i was here so i was able to watch it um and I, this is the spot this is the point in the construction where the local crew 
got a little nervous because none of them had ever done any of the resilient clip stuff. And I know that the, the foreman and, and the owner were here sort of just staring at the walls <laughs> periodically to say, okay, <laughs> yeah, now look at the weird. plans again. Let's see. <laughs> um, so they actually sort of mocked one up to see how it all fit together. And, uh, and they did a really good job. Man, they, and they uh, did amazing. Yeah, like, and thrilled. they just did, uh, uh, the attention to detail was there and uh, like I say it all the time but that's what you want out of a contractor is attention to detail mm -hmm. excited about learning a new trick because I'd say 80% of our jobs are built by a contractor that's never done it before and uh, you know if they're if they're open to learn um, we can help guide that process yeah. and so it's great um, kind of moving on we actually have drywall at this stage um, and you've got um, you know doors aren't installed yet the exterior windows are in but not the interior windows that, that doubles it up you see uh, some mm -hmm. of the HVAC work that's happening in the back of the control room on on these photos where um, you know cuts into the room at one point but then it, it snakes through with the flexible ducting and then dumps mm -hmm. into the room at another spot uh, which just creates kind of a labyrinth for sound to try to uh, get in and out of the space it makes it really difficult uh, to do that uh, so that's a, a neat detail then oscar and i came up we got oscar uh um there next to me and then uh, jacob schneider from from vintage king and, and you we all went to to lunch and did some acoustical testing in the space um so this was when we arrived it was snowing i think it was march and it was it was snowing at that point um and uh we we got in there first off we have to talk about charlie because uh i, just, <laughs> I, I fell in love with charlie like uh and he was uh i mean weeks old at that point I, I, yeah he was maybe... born in january of uh 22 so he yeah he was the pup yeah Still he was like eight weeks old or something like that and yeah. so um he, he got to hang around uh while we were doing some acoustical testing in the room <laughs> Um, had some uh, loner uh, uh, focals from from Vintage King we set up just to get a sense of how the room was performing because we had done models of the space and predicted things but it, there's nothing quite like uh, really uh, measuring the response of the room so that we could then tailor that acoustical treatment plan to solve those issues and so that was what what that day was all about um, and then a little while later there's the big day of, of that API yeah. console being delivered um, which is didn't you say it's 2,000 pounds, something like that? Uh, well, the, the console was 1,000. The desk that it went into was 1,000. So fortunately, the desk didn't come in that box. It came in its own boxes. Nice. But that's a, um, So this is a, um, a 1608 console with a box car of, of 16 channels and a TV screen in the middle and a patch bay on the right. So in total, it's 96 inches long. And about... 80 inches of it, roughly, um, is in that box. It did not come in part. It came right. fully assembled, which was astounding to all of us. I mean, I don't think anybody saw that coming, but so there's the box. It weighed a thousand pounds, roughly. I think it was 957 on the, the lading, bill of lading. You can round up to a thousand on that. I'll give you that. We had no way to get it from the contractor's building office which is where that is down to where we were going uh which is this is a pretty remote location down in dirt road um so the owner bob biggs pulled his pickup truck back <laughs> up to the semi and um we got it on the pickup there's, there's probably another picture or two that shows i don't know if i, I put more that. in there i didn't i didn't show it but yeah okay. it ended up on that truck on the four by four truck and then we hauled it down to the garage and gently got it off the truck and it sat in the garage then for quite a while until we were ready to put it in the room so yeah that's amazing so cool um you know next steps after we did all that testing you know we we needed to to design the acoustical treatment inside of there so i only screen captured a couple things in here um uh, but you know it's kind of top view of the control room showing you know stretch fabric uh, systems around the room base traps in the corners uh that diffuser array that you see right behind you there um and mm -hmm. then even some some of the vertical uh like elevations of of the space um and uh yeah there's base trapping in different areas just making use of, of what we can um and making sure that we get a, a really nice uh, flat frequency response in there 
uh, this is uh, another picture that you sent me after um, Solar 2 Studios came in and did their thing. So you, you see these sections that are four inches deep of, of stretch fabric on the side walls, and, and then there's a big base trap that goes here around that HVAC uh, ducting. You've got um, uh, the beautiful diffusers there. And then uh, one thing we, we talk about in the video, too, is that the, this... Uh, uh, kind of cedar um, chair rail that that was put around the entire space this kind of wainscoting uh, detail and that was a way to keep that electrical uh, those electrical outlets from penetrating the drywall and ma make sure that you know they, they they're not uh, uh, weakening the isolation system which is another great detail that the contractor took care of um, but yeah just beautiful space um, uh, there's the front of the room there with the stretch fabric, and and then this was before any of the ceiling clouds were were installed. But uh, yeah, the Solar Two Studios uh, guys did did an amazing job with that. Um, this is the outside of the space um, uh, from the lake side, uh, looking back at the studio, and just a beautiful uh, beautiful building. And and uh, it's like I said, something I'd like to have in my backyard. And then the star of the show, uh, Charlie, is older. At that point, I think I I may I went through the mm -hmm. folder and I may have more photos of Charlie than I do the studio, um, but you know I I I just I love that. <laughs> well, guy. So He's do awesome. I. If it makes you feel any yeah, <laughs> but uh, yeah, there's uh, Charlie all grown up. This is you know I think he was I don't know how many months old he was at this point when we made our second trip, but uh, but yeah, he was hanging out okay. and uh, you know got to. Uh, that's when we filmed the YouTube video that's on our channel uh, yeah. just to walk through the space and and uh, this is it when it's finished you know it's just a uh, it's a, it's a space that like when I'm there yeah. I don't want to leave you know like it's it's just a, um, a a beautiful spot it sounds amazing um, you know I recently when we were up there for vacation it was fun to uh, take my kids and my wife uh, to see it like we came over and and uh, um, got to, to see the studio because it was the first studio I've been doing this for how many years, but it's the first studio that I've designed that my wife, uh, was ever in. Um, and my kids either. You know, like, so it's the first one they ever got to see. Um, well, that's, that's here. quite, thank you. Yeah. Thanks for yeah, giving and, me that up. Uh, and they <laughs> each got to play a song, you know, so we, we exactly. whipped out the old time and, uh, plugged yep. it in. Um, it, and everybody chose their favorite song and we put it on to hear, hear how the room sounded. And of course yeah. it performed spectacularly. <laughs> uh, I was, I was joking, uh, because my daughter decided to pick, um, let it go from frozen, of course. And, uh, <laughs> you know, that, uh, I, I was like, I don't know how many times that song gets played through, uh, API console and, and, uh, ATC speakers, but. Well, it was probably when it was quickly mixed, maybe, but, you know, not since yeah. then. <laughs> right. And then uh, she also played um, uh, the Ponyo song uh, from the Studio oh, yeah. Ghibli uh, movie that we've been watching a lot. Um, Grayson got to listen to some different things in there as well. He wanted to hear um, uh, Bridge Over Tro Troubled Water uh, from Simon and Garfunkel. Um, and That's quite a pure taste in music i know i know i, I think it's i'm pretty sure it's from some meme that he he's been watching but uh <laughs> <laughs> but yeah it, it was really fun to be able to see them um hear a room that sounds as good as as this one does because you know we listen to those things on in the car or on a home stereo or whatever but it's it's a different world when you're in this space and uh, yeah yeah, it was just just really really fun uh, to to be there. I mean, you've you've been able to to be in the room for a while now, and and uh, I mean, what's what's uh, from the start of the project to now? Is it anything like you thought it was going to be, or is it hopefully no, better, I, maybe uh, not worse? <laughs> I had no clue. You know, I've met, I said this before on a, on one of those videos, and it, that. I can you can look at the drawings and you can see the renderings, but you never get a, a real sense of you know what it's going to be like until it's done. And it, it um, it's phenomenal. I mean, I just like spending time in here. Yeah, um, this is where I practice yeah. my my instruments, and uh, I find myself sitting down. It's funny. I've done a lot of mixing of of stuff um, in Ohio in my little studio, and I have started down the path of remixing everything here <laughs> because I put it on these speakers and I think 
oh man <laughs> <laughs> you know the base is money or this and that and uh uh, and some of the stuff that's my own band, I'm fortunate enough to be able to re-record the bass line if it's that bad. You know? Sometimes, <laughs> you know. Um, but it's just been a real a, a fun thing. And I've recorded some local musicians. The, the whole point of this is to help people along the way, you know, in their careers. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, Traverse City, which is where I'm near, uh, um, has a lot of talent you know there's a lot of young people yeah. uh, who are very good and it's you know i will say that one of the, the my favorite stories about local talent is um there's a place nor north of here a little a few miles where they have a summer concert festival on fridays and mm -hmm. um four or five years ago we went to see this uh, bluegrass thing and it was a, a local guy whose name is Don Julian and this other kid named Billy Strings. Oh, wow. And, uh, and this is when Billy was still cutting his teeth. Well, he never, I don't think he was ever cutting his teeth, but yeah, he was just Billy Strings who was playing in a little duo with a guy named Don Julian, who was a mandolin player. And I swear it was like, wow. You know, I mean, it, even five years ago, the kid was blowing people away and you thought well i'm not sure what talent looks like when it's just about to get big i think this is it and yeah. lo and behold you know, five years later he's a grammy award winner he plays coliseums and i got mm -hmm. a chance to see him again at a big basketball arena in winston-salem north carolina when i was visiting some friends sold out shows two nights in a row you know it's just eighteen thousand seats and people are going crazy. And I remember telling my son, Dave, the drummer, um, that I was going to go see Billy Strings. And I'm thinking it's going to be, you know, we're down south. We're going to have a quiet, sit down sort of concert. Mm -hmm. Dave said, get ready for the hippies, Dad. And I said, <laughs> what are hippies? This, this is bluegrass. He said, you'll see what I'm talking about. We got there and it was a mad People never sat down. I guess that's just the way concerts are these days. Yeah. But it was, they were crazy. And, and he's a phenomenal player. His band's phenomenal. Awesome. And uh, so that's my, I, I knew him win story, you know. But um, Yeah, that's great. There's a lot of people I mean, up here like that. Um, there is, yeah. Maybe not like that. But. Right. But, but I think it's one of those places where, um, like, your studio, as soon as people obviously it's kind of this hidden gem right now you don't a lot of people have not seen it before and i think it's by design like it's right. it's a bit private but um uh, i i know for a fact that uh as soon as people come into this this space they're gonna they're gonna want to record there you know it's it's yeah. a, a really well, i hope so i mean it's the business plan is is ill-defined at this point um because <laughs> it's as, as you say it's a it's a real push pull thing well i i'd like to draw these people but I don't want anybody to know where it is, you know, <laughs> yeah. um, because I'm in a, I'm in a quiet area here and, um, I don't have many neighbors, but I'm sure none of them would want to be awakened in the middle of the night when Metallica drives in the driveway or something like yeah. that. Be silly, but, um, it's not, it's not that kind of a space, you know, right. it, it would be a nice demo space for s some, great acts or it would be a great place for somebody who was trying to make it to get a nice recording and um mm -hmm. yeah and it's also um an opportunity for me to watch some really good engineers hopefully um yeah there's a an artist coming here in the fall i may have mentioned this of 2024 so a year mm -hmm. from this fall mm -hmm. um his name is jesse terry and he's uh has had a lot of records out he's he's still in an up and coming sort of stage but he, he's good enough to have had a lot of um good session guys playing his records and does, does a lot of it in nashville so and he'll bring an engineer who's a really good engineer um and stuff like that you know i'm i, I don't profess to be the world's greatest engineer i i can fight my way around the board and pro tools but it'll be fun to to apprentice to somebody that really knows what they're doing and uh you know not have to pay Sweetwater to teach me <laughs> um, anyway and spend two days in fort wayne 
and, right. Uh, right. Hopefully remember something. But you know, if you get to spend two or three weeks being a gopher for the for somebody that really has some skills, that that's a great way to do it. And so, in part, it's selfish on my part to have a great way to learn. And uh, you know, the, the people I already know, like Jason and and Jacob, are already you know those level of, of, of engineers. Yeah. And um, they just haven't come here and shown me anything yet. Yeah. You know? Well, I'm excited to see what what you end up what you end up doing because I, I do think that it's going to be there's going to be a lot of amazing music that that comes out of that space. And uh, I mean, it's one if you look back on all, all the projects we've done, it's it's one that uh, 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 was one of the most fun for us. You know, and and one of the yeah. big things too. I mean, there's we talked about like it's the first studio my wife got to hear my my kids and then my my niece Liz was there as well she got to listen to a Matt Maltese uh, a song in in that space too um you know it's like uh, so it's a first for a lot of those things but um uh, one of the things that I'm most uh uh that, that that even though this studio came out of it like honestly like getting to know you and being a friend you know like uh I think that, that is um for all the projects we work Musical. on, we're, we're ble- yeah, we're we're blessed to to really uh, get to know people uh, on this process. And I mean, you couldn't be uh, any nicer of a person. And, and uh, you know, uh, it's it's cool to form that relationship and and just kind of see where where things go uh, with the studio and 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 your life moving forward. So, so thanks yeah. thanks for letting us be a part of it. You know, I'm always like. Um, you know, when people select us to be their designer, I, I don't take that lightly. And it's just something that I'm always um, uh, just really honored yeah. to do. And, and uh, yeah, it was great. Well, we're not, we're not done with this place yet, obviously, because I have my first big session with my son's band coming up here in August. And that's a six piece loud band. And they're going to start putting down tracks for their new album. And, um, they do a lot of dubbing, so I don't think it's going to be a problem. Um, but we'll see. You know, that's that's more people than I've had in here, and uh, yep. it may be time to do that extra room pretty quick here once we see how that flies. But I'd love to do it anyway. I'd love to do it. It will. This is only part one. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you know, and I, I may well, have to knock out a wall and you know expand. You know, I'm just kidding. Yeah. Uh, people will have to tune in for the updates as as we go. But That's and good. thanks so much Great. for for joining us on the podcast too. I know a lot of people are, are going to be excited to see this whole process and to learn more about it. Uh, this studio, it's beautiful. And and uh, again, thanks for thanks for having us involved with it. Uh- a delight. Thank you very much, Gavin. Thanks. It's always fun to catch up with Chip. Uh, it was a really great conversation, and and uh, man, it, it, what an amazing studio to have in your backyard. Um, if you guys uh, really enjoyed that or had any questions about uh, the studio itself, feel free to comment below, or you can email us at info at haversickdesigns.com. I would appreciate if you like, subscribe, and, and share this video with anyone that uh, you think would, would enjoy Chip's studio. And uh, thank you again for being part of the sound project. We'll see you next week.